Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the property market. Um, I did kind of, what I worked out some time ago, my background uh, degree is actually in economics, and when I started working in the property market, I had no idea there was any kind of connection uh, whatsoever. And the more I kind of learned about property, particularly prices and rents, which are even more interesting when it comes to economics, is that this lot, these three things are absolutely critical. You cannot succeed, in my view, in the property market unless you understand the economics and what's going on around you, and you cannot succeed today not that I can even follow what's going on, quite frankly, with regards to politics. So what I want to try and do is just explain to you tonight, not just how they interact, but also explain to you what's kind of happening nationally, but most importantly, what's happening at the local level. And that is absolutely critical. So, and some kind of good stuff uh, from your perspective. So you can slightly relax. If you're worried, if you've got property in this area, relax a little bit. I can't say that to everybody across the country. Um, it's not the same thing. So, I'm going to do it in reverse order, that's how the things are done best. So, we're going to start a little bit with the economy. Um, there's lots of charts and there's lots of numbers. Don't worry so much about the numbers or everything. I mean, charts are just weekly lines at the end of the day. Numbers basically you just need to know if they're going up, down, or staying the same. That's all you kind of need to worry about. So, don't let any of this stuff uh, frighten you. So, this basically, uh, this line tells you when we're doing really well as an economy and when we're doing really badly. So, no surprise, back in 2008, you remember the credit crunch? Yeah. Uh, you woke up in the morning, you could see kind of a big slide at the back uh, behind saying everything was going down. Uh, and that was a pretty buff time. And the good news is, we're not there at this moment in time, and we're not expected to get there for a little while. However, what you can see from the yellow line is things aren't going as well as they did. So, after a recession, you tend to get a little bit of a boost. And what we're seeing now is that starting to come back. So, big economic term, subdued is how we describe that at the moment. And ideally, if you want everything to be going well, uh, particularly in the property, you kind of want everything to kind of be on the up. So, that's a little bit of a, a warning. The biggest problem, though, is how uncertain the outlook is. So, from a GDP perspective, uh, we're looking at remaining under 2%. And that's just all you need to remember from this is that under 2% is kind of okay, but if it starts falling below that, that's bad news. Anything you hear of GDP or GBA is the other work term that they measure the economy with, actually that's quite good news. Um, and that means things are likely to be on the up. So that's all you need to remember. But this is probably one of the most interesting things for property. This is called a consumer confidence index. There's various ones around there, but I like this one because it makes it very simple for me. It tells me consumers are really confident at this moment in time. That means they'll rent quite happily, but they'll also go and spend lots of money on property and everything that they're going to put into it. And that drives the economy forward. No surprise at this moment in time, considering we had a big freeze last year, followed by uh, Jaguar and various other companies uh, talking about losses. Uh, and obviously, it brings up to date. So we've got, we then had the high street, remember? Last, just before summer, there was lots of upset about the high street disappearing and the problems that that was causing. What really didn't help the consumer confidence, was, particularly in property, was reports in the media coming out from Mark Hardy saying house prices would fall by 35% if when we Brexit. Who remembers that? Never happened. <clears throat> so whenever you hear a title like that, just say, I'll just check that out. Unfortunately, what was rarely reported, though I did manage to uh, get it on uh, Radio 4 Mobox, who are usually very good on these kind of things, what he actually said was bizarrely good news. He actually said, if property prices fall by 35%, the banks can cope. Well, they don't fall by 35%, apart from some of the stats I'll show later. So that was a good news story. It's an actual fact, it's panicked everybody, and it's helped things be a bit <coughs> subdued. How daft are we as a country? So, it is looking uncertain. And the other thing you've got to remember is that although, uh, well, you know, for those who've been here before, you know my belief is that property is very localised and how it performs. But what I've realised now, we've seen, we've only really seen this as much since it's bad, since about 2005. But I've never seen it as stark as this. So I would like us all to be, is anybody Scottish? Yeah, I'm going to travel to all sorts of Scotland and I want you to imagine we're in Aberdeen. What's the worst thing to happen to Aberdeen over the last sort of four or five years? What's dropped significantly? Oil. Oil. <coughs> Aberdeen is this incredible. Has anybody been to Aberdeen? 
It's an incredibly isolated place. It takes a long time to get to. Yeah? So it is. Just imagine it as its own little country. And what's happened is, interestingly, all the prices at the credit front, when we were all suffering with prices falling and indeed rates down as well, what actually happened in Aberdeen did not only recession at all. Because oil, when it went down, it went down for a very short period of time. Interestingly, they're really suffering at this moment in time. They're seeing a crash that they've never ever seen or experienced before. And if you have a look at what's happening on rent, so looking up there on the current uh, price index, so home <coughs> traffic at 20 cities, and what they're saying is the prices have gone up by about 3% year on year, and Aberdeen is falling by 6. That's been going on for some time now. Look at the rent. So this is one bed uh, property renting for just over 500, down by 5%, down by 30% over the last five years. This is pure economics. And it just shows you, I just really want to kind of, this brings home brilliantly how much the local economy impacts on one market. Because these figures are not happening anywhere else at all. This is just Aberdeen purely down to oil. So it's fascinating. So my next, anybody think about where I might be looking at next to do a little bit of a watch? <coughs> Which area around the UK had some very bad news a few weeks ago? Swindon. Yeah. So I'm now going to be looking at Swindon because I think it's possible that might go a similar, not quite as bad as this, but it might go a similar way. Because that's a big job loss. And it's the uncertainty that will drive it. Because there is a lot of fear there. That's a lot of jobs. There's some families there who I think are something like 15 people in one family are all losing their job or be in two years' time. Um, that's what's happening. So bearing that in mind, well, how, what you want to know really is, or, so it's has the East of England stacking up. And it's not too bad, so I've kind of given you everything here, but let's focus on the east. So you're just under, in the east, in the, uh, east area, just under, uh, sorry, for up to 2007, you're up to 3%, you're about middling. And then actually, you've not done too badly since 2010, 2016, since we've seen the uh, property market, since, since we've seen the recovery uh, from the credit crunch. So you're doing okay here. And remember, though, that, that includes a lot of different places. East of England. <coughs> If this is Cambridge, this will probably be off the chart by now. Uh, and of course that's beautiful because that affects the very immediate surrounding areas that you're in. And the other thing when you sort of break this down in the, in the east of England, and you say, right, okay, well our growth is going to be a bit similar around here to the UK, but there's two pieces of really good news in here. And I can't kind of stress how important this stuff is. Your unemployment rate is really low. And that's great news because Swindon's going to be looking at that in the future. And as a result of that, that's going to affect rents. And that's also going to affect what the rents they pay. So if I was a Swindon landlord and I didn't have <laughs> rent arrears as an insurance, I would probably go and talk to an expert about that at this moment in time. But you have a pretty good unemployment rate here, and it's pretty low. So that's good news as far as uh, the people that you're renting to. Also, they tend to earn, obviously there's different scales, but they tend to earn more than other people across the country. And that means that you charge high rates. We know that whatever's happening in the rental market, what's ever happening to your cost, it basically rents track wages. They are almost, we talk in economics, I remember when I did the theory about perfect market, I never understood why because I'm quite a practical person and this perfect market never existed. But at the end of the day, actually when you look at rents and you look at wages, they're almost perfectly aligned. So you see when, rents, when wages are going up, rents will go up. And when wages are falling, so rents will do the same, and that's what happened in the recession. There's another fantastic thing that's happening in this area. And one thing that you, you want is you want a rising demand, don't you? So you want increase the best best market is rising demand, short supply. That typically, if prices can go up, but they will always be kept by wages, they will. And the lovely thing is, is next to London, you're expected to see the second biggest increase in population. So demand is good in this area um, for, obviously, for good properties. So actually, economically, whatever else you're being told and however bad the news is in Swindon, you're not there. Okay? So you don't have to worry about that. Slightly better economic performance. Probably the most exciting thing I think about this is the potential for this area to grow from a population perspective, because that's good uh, demand. So huge growth in localised population. Then, I almost get so excited I start to shake. <laughs> because I keep looking at this Cambridge, <coughs> Oxford corridor 
and it is phenomenal. It's a, and a, how many people have you driven on the A14? Enjoying that? Is it, do you talk about it every night? About how long the queues were? I went to Chelmsford the other day, my sister lived in Colchester and I come from Lincoln, so I am a regular to the A14. However, my drive to Chelmsford was lovely, partly because Tuesday was a sunny day, but most importantly because I could see a new road. And that's very exciting. You kind of feel we're nearly there when you do that, don't you? But a million new jobs. It's almost like even if that doesn't happen, I, I can't find anywhere where that's going to happen. This is an amazing opportunity for growth. Everybody, if you're an investment and if you're interested, you should just be so excited about it. <coughs> so excited about new roads, and you're getting both, and they're huge, and they're linking these unbelievably economic, successfully successful areas. But also, you're not that far from London. So, it, for me, I can kind of see all this and go, "Look, can't work." This ticks so many boxes from that perspective. Um, so, this is also a chart with wiggly lines. Um, what I do know, what I would take out of this, is apparently on your uh, road link, uh, option B, which is the purple line, has been um, selected. So I would be driving up and down that, looking for opportunities. That's the sort of thing I do, that's how you bring it down to your level. You just drive up and down that and you go, well, I wonder where people will kind of move to. Where's the opportunities here? So uh, that's your new road link. And then you have this amazing new rail link, and I'd be driving <coughs> up and down that. Where are the new railway stations going to be? We've been trying to find North Cambridge, but we haven't quite found that yet. Have we? Uh, but apparently, does anybody think North Cambridge? Yeah? Is it exciting? No. No? But you must get excited about it. It's people. It's people. It links all of our economies together. That's why I'm very excited. It's like, what? What? in your world, okay? So it's about really understanding how that's going to impact on the area, how, where people are going to be drawn in, and where demand therefore is going to be higher than supply. So that's kind of why it gets more exciting. Now we come to politics. It's exciting, but I have to say, writing presentations on the day before that are then suddenly out of date is really frustrating. And we're in a mess. Uh, we really are in a mess. And the problem we have is that, you know, I talked about possible economic uncertainty and people are nervous, so they're not maybe buying at the level they do, and if they don't do that, prices don't go up. Good for the rental sector, typically. The rental sector did very, very well um, during the recession once rent started to recover. Um, but the problem we have at this moment is this huge uncertainty about politics. And um, my big worry is somebody like Honda pulling out. They've done that, I think, partly because you've looked at what's going on in our politics and gone, wow, do we really want to be in this mess for the next 10 years, 20 years? Because those are the decisions they're making. And I think whatever they've said, that actually they probably couldn't come out and say, we really aren't sure about what's going on in your parliament at the moment, but it looks rudderless. And if you're a business, do you really want to be working in a country where nobody seems to be able to lead it out of trouble at this moment? that's really what you want, and there's plenty of other places that are much safer politically to some extent than ours. So um, it's difficult really to say what will happen next, because actually we have no idea, and it keeps changing every day. So um, I'll talk to you about that, I think it's best to kind of, sort of part that and talk to you about the scenarios. What I can tell you is that whatever's happening Brexit-wise and MP-wise, life goes on. The good news is that there are some very good civil servants who are working very, very hard to try and make the property market place. Some things that are, that are being done are good, some things aren't as good. So I'm going to run you through kind of the property stuff. So currently, one of the things which is hurting you at this moment in time is the government believes that home ownership, they want to grow that, and they believe the way to do it is by hurting you guys. It's fairly simple. Um, and everybody feels that? Yeah? You can sort of see where that's coming from. Um, I find it really, so they've also introduced good things like help to buy. I like help to buy. I don't like some of the developers that use the money and don't necessarily build good quality homes, but the ones that do, I think it's a good scheme because it delivers supply. I never understand the right to buy scheme where somebody, because they've lived in a social home, pay half the rent that anybody else would do, uh, suddenly they get a hundred grand a like gift. I don't, I don't quite understand how you can decide how to buy and say right to buy is fine in those folks. So they're definitely looking to drive ownership. The other problem they have is in the last election, Labour polled highest for property and for housing amongst all the political parties. 
So the Conservatives are under tremendous amounts of pressure that when Labour come out with something that's popular and they back tenants, not landlords, understandably, 10 million tenants, less than 2 million landlords, it's just maths. Mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the day, they're just numbers. So they are under a tremendous pressure to support tenants um, and almost to hurt landlords. Um, they're back from Bill Spread, which is big um, institutions, and I'm a big fan of that. Um, they are increasing enforcement, and do you know what? I know nobody is here, but if you're letting a property and you're not doing it legally, I don't really have, I'm not going to feel sorry for you. The laws are out there, you've got good people out there to support you. Um, but the idea that they're going to reduce buy to let investment to me is where that's not quite right. That's where they've kind of got the policy wrong. Um, the other side that is good is they're starting to support uh, the building of social and council homes. Because actually, you're not the problem. The problem is, is that 25 to 30 percent of the people on benefits are in the private rented sector. And actually, if you bought land and built in Cambridge, I doubt you would be able to afford to be able to make any profit at all if you tried to let somebody when there's benefit gaps around. So they've kind of broken their own model. And bear in mind, this was all driven uh, by the Conservatives. So, um, in the first place. So the question is, how much will this impact on the market? My view is this very, very anti-landlord sentiment um, and reality that you're feeling at the moment, I, I think that will change, and here's why. Tenant demand is increasing. And what they've done is come up with an idea where in places like um, Cambridge and Shorters, they're robbing Peter to pay Paul. So they're saying, what we want is a buy to let, we want you lot to sell, so that first time buyers can just magically get deposits and suddenly buy it. And I point out and say, well, okay, but what if that tenant's on benefits? What if they're students? What if they're migrant workers? What if they've just got divorced? You're assuming that this swap will work, and lo and behold, it just doesn't work. And the result is, as they're finding in London, eviction levels are going up, particularly when you're having all the problems with universal credit, and the people who are really, really losing from this policy are vulnerable tenants. And their, their homelessness is going up, and there is no, they cannot find. And they keep saying, well, how can we get landlords to support us? And I'm going, you've lost them. And you've lost them for some years. Go find another way. And they haven't quite understood that. They will, because the situation will only get worse. The good news is, though, they're doing a lot of work to increase the professionalism of the sector. And I like that. There are some landlords leaving the market. There are an estimated 20% of agents will lose, uh, will, will close down in the next year or two. It's partly due to the loss of the tenant fees, um, and it's partly, it's some of it's to do with sort of more online, but that actually seems to have kind of petered out a little bit um, at this moment in time. But, you know, it's not a cheap thing to run an agent, not if you're going to do it properly. Um, so some of them are, are expected to go, but actually the real ones who are expected to go are the ones that don't have client money protection, which they have to have legally from the 1st of April, and can't get it because their finances are in such a state. So if any of you are using an agent at this moment, please double check that they have client money protection in place now. If they don't, and they don't have it from the 1st of April, they are breaking the law, and when the tenant fee come, ban comes in, they go bust as a result, they will take your rental money with them, and your potentially your deposits. So it's a really critical uh, thing to be aware of. Um, and we'll see offices closed. The other, the other good thing that's coming is this amazing technological solutions coming in. Is anybody looking at refurbing this year in some of their rental properties? Have a serious look at some of the stuff that's out there. Wouldn't it be lovely? I don't think quite hit there yet, but we're talking about boilers that will tell you they're going to break down before they actually do. <laughs> that would be great, wouldn't it? So really have a look at some of the technical, technological stuff that's coming in because it can massively reduce your maintenance. It might require a little bit of an extra spend now, and it is difficult with technology to get it timing right. But it is worth looking at what you can do from a maintenance perspective to make life easy. Could you just set the, set the settings of heating the tenants on day one and they never have to touch it for the rest of the year? My word, think of how much that time that would save everybody would be fabulous. So, talked about the economic side, talked about the politics side, and what I want to do now is kind of just give you a little bit of history on the sort of where we've got to properly, and then I'm going to kind of pull it all together um, in one go. So, this is the history of prices from 2000 to 2009. Uh, and you might think, well, that's a bit old hat, Kate, but it's not old hat because it's very interesting and you need to be aware of what's happened to prices um, to understand how to invest in the future. 
So you can see east of England and England, on average, how many people bought in 2000? Remember paying 85,000 for a house? Very lucky they did. It's like winning the lottery, that is. And you can see there's that huge increase, 108, 111%, just in five years. <coughs> Phenomenal. The reason we had that increase in, uh, was that mortgages moved away from three and a half times income to affordability. Buy to let money came in, and something called bank of mum and dad. Huge amounts of money. And, and I'm not going to ask, I was about to ask, who's done bank of mum and dad? Personally, I think bank of mum and dad has caused prices to rise far, far more than landlords, just as there must have been more often. So that has allowed prices to go up more than anything else. What you can then see is, um, so that's why they go. So any data you see on house prices pre-2005, telling you it's the best investment in the world, totally ignore it. Because there were five exceptional years where prices grew at a rate that they haven't done since and they never did before. So you must only ever look at data from 2005. What you can then see is that prices grew in the next two years by about 20%. And East of England performs pretty well, uh, matches England. But then, who remembers the credit crunch? Bang! Prices came down. Great if you're in a buying opportunity, that's kind of what you want, really. Um, as long as you can hold on to your own uh, properties if you've got a decent enough deposit. So, and <coughs> what we saw here, though, over these sort of nine years, was price movements were very consistent. So they pretty much happened, maybe at slightly different times, but they were pretty consistent over the same period. And you can see when you break this down to Cambridge, Peterborough, and Huntingdonshire, Pretty much the same. And what's quite interesting, I always say prices go in waves. So Cambridge had a little wave up to 2005, and then it had a big wave, uh, whereas in comparison, Peterborough had this massive wave going up to 2005, but then what it didn't do is it didn't perform too well the next couple of years. And that's very, very usual for that kind of thing to happen. But when it came crashing down, prices came crashing down to the same level pretty much at every level. So that's the kind of history. But it doesn't matter what happened, on average. What absolutely matters is how many people sit every day with a cup of coffee and look at house price data. It's so exciting. <laughs> and this is why it's so exciting, because if you have got a property of your own, or you're buying a property, wouldn't you love to know how it performed over the last 20 years? Would you like that to be free? Free it is! So this should be your coffee break, uh, whatever you have as your 11s is. What you can see here is that this property performed pretty much the same up until kind of like the 2007 level. It dropped by about the same amount. It's not had a bad recovery, that's not bad uh, for a few years to recover, and now it's got more. So that's an okay fact. You know, in terms of what happened in the past, do you think that one's all right? This one, though, is probably slightly better, because this property didn't really have much of a recession as far as the um, credit crunch was concerned. So from 2006, 2010, 2013, when everybody else was dropping by 20%, it pretty much held its ranking. And that's a nice, that's kind of if I was looking and had the choice, I'd probably look for a property that was, had this kind of, uh, didn't have the fall in the past uh, that we had before. And then there's another one here that kind of didn't seem to suffer that much, but had an amazing recovery. Uh, up, to, up to 2018. So this data is sitting there. So ignore what you're told really on an average basis. Because it doesn't matter. Your individual property could be performing completely different to everything you're being told. So it's really, really important to get through to this. <coughs> Having said all of that, on average moving forward, what we do think is looking at past data is that price growth is erratic. Very property, it's very individual to the property, but it is slow, and for the first time since 2000, it's capped. And it's capped for two reasons. One, because the affordability is not now based on two or three percent interest rates, it's based on six or seven, which is a good thing. That hopefully means that prices won't fall so much in the next recession, but I'm not saying it's the end of boom and bust, the property will always be boom and bust. Um, but also because the lenders are limited to the amount of money they can lend at four and a half times income. So that's what slow prices in Cambridge and slow prices in London, and they're hitting that affordability buffer. So these will focus on, I'll just look at the sort of Cambridge data to show you what I'm kind of saying. So the green one, which says that house prices grew 5% if you took today's price versus 2005, smoothed it out, on average, house prices grew by about 5% each year. 
If you then compare it to 2007, the height of the market, they only grew by four. And if you look at the year on year, it's slowed even further to just under 2%. So we are seeing, and you'll see with the forecast, there is definitely that lovely price growth that you're used to, that's probably not going to be repeated for some years to come. But it doesn't mean that's not going to be repeated on your individual property. Okay? You've just got to pick much more carefully than you have in the past. <clears throat> as far as rent's concerned, you evil, really, <laughs> look at the skyrocketing, extortionate rental increases. Hang on a minute. That's 3%, isn't it? Yeah, so what this is basically saying is since May 2012, these are the Office of National Statistics. They are the government's own data that basically says you increase rents typically less than general inflation. How you are accused of skyrocketing rents and exhaustion, I still cannot quite work it out. Because in actual fact, in the main, on, uh, when you look over the last certainly 10 years, inflation goes up by about 3%, and everybody's happy with that. They're happy for people who, uh, for housing associations, typically to increase their rents by inflation plus a little bit extra. But you, kind ladies and gentlemen, you increase it by 2% versus 3% inflation. So it is a really unfair, and I, I don't understand, and I'm trying very hard to get this across to people, but it is quite a hard thing to do. But it is important to bear in mind, and actually it doesn't matter what national stuff, the only thing that should ever be of any interest in is what happens to your personal rent and what's happening locally. And it is important that you look at increasing your rents each year. It is done for housing associations, because if you don't increase your rents by inflation each year, what are you doing firstly to your own wage? You're reducing it. And if you reduce it by not paying rents up for five years, you can't pay the maintenance. Try and do more yourself. You end up with a £30,000 fine from the local authority because you accidentally breached one of the rules and regulations. So it is important to look at, and if you think about it, you're not doing tenants any favour. Say they're paying 800 quid to start off with, and five years later you haven't increased the rent. Now they're going to have to pay 1000 1100 to go and rent somewhere because you didn't do these little incremental things each year. Funny enough, that's why you're accused of skyrocketing and extortion of rents. Because they paid 800 and now they're paying 1100 So the little incremental amounts are much, much better than a five-year shock to a tenant system. So, what will happen next? We have three scenarios, and I can't kind of do it much better than this. So, at the moment, we're in scenario one, which I call stagnation. Prices, rent's pretty static, although you saw from the previous slide, it's all local. Cambridge is not doing too bad, St. Ives doing slightly better, probably because more people are coming out, um, this is the sort of thing Maxine will know more than I, coming out from Cambridge because that's kind of topped out, and then uh, coming out to Great City, like St. Ives and pushing up the rents. Uh, and volume to low, and part of the reason is that is because everybody's going, I'll just stay where I am until we know where we're going in this country, and we appear to have a parliament that can make decisions. Because that would be kind of nice, and I prefer to do that. They could be a little bit of a bounce back second half. And the reason being, we've had, when you have stagnation, you have six months of a lot of people not buying and maybe batting down the hatches from a rental perspective. And then what they do, when things get settled, they go, oh, let's all go out and, let's all go out and buy now. And suddenly you get this rush of demand. Okay. So you might see a little bit of a bounce back. That's probably the best scenario. What could happen is we have, and it might not even be, the interesting thing is it may not even be Brexit. Pakistan and India <coughs> fighting each other is not a good news because that hurts the economy. Trump and, uh, so Russia, sorry, China, it is very complicated to remember this, China and America trade wars. That could come, China's not doing particularly well at this moment. If they get even worse, well, we're all a little bit sunk. So as far as these three scenarios, the best thing to say to you is just make sure you talk to your broker and your tax guy and to your agent. How do I manage? How do I manage in each of these scenarios? And as an investor, you should know. None of these should ever come as a shock to you because you're going to invest for a long time and you're going to have to deal with it. <coughs> and actually, we've all, we've all been through it before, so it's not, it's not it's kind of scary from an unknown. 
So we might go for a hard landing. I'm not sure the prices would fall as much as they did before. Famous last words, that's gone on the camera. Uh, but, and the main reason for that is because the lending at the moment is solid. The only reason why we look at more is if uh, interest rates really jack up um, and people are then forced to sell. That's what, that's what causes prices uh, to fall like they did in the credit crunch. Rents will be stable to rising and partly rising because um, we haven't got enough stock in quite a lot of areas. New York areas is one of those. Um, and, but the volumes will be kind of quite low. So it's quite a kind of tough market for anybody that's uh, in the industry. Um, I like to play a game called How Low Can We Go at this point? And uh, I've actually presented this to first time buyers, and they were decidedly, unbelievably cheered after I did this. Because I'm of the opinion that if you know what happened during the last credit crunch, and you know how bad it's got, and you have a plan if it happens again, you'll sleep at night and you'll make better decisions. So, what we've done is we've taken, uh, and I'll show you a bit more of this in a minute, Belfast, Glasgow, Edinburgh and Cardiff, and Belfast had a massive, you know everybody talks about a property price bubble? And I keep going, it's going to burst, it's going to burst, it's going to burst. Well, it's going to burst. Belfast, it has burst. 58% it fell by. It's recovering now. And so met, Belfast is doing really well. It's like, oh yes, it's only 40% down. Fabulous. They must be thrilled. <laughs> and it fell, property prices fell for five years and, uh, five years and six months. And they still have not recovered they probably won't for some decades to come unless anything <coughs> happens. Uh, as far as Glasgow is concerned, Glasgow is quite interesting. That has recovered, but it took quite a long time. It took a bit more of a battering than uh, the other areas. But interesting, during those five years and eight months, it fell five times, and each time it fell, it fell lower than the last time. Whereas Edinburgh, uh, that didn't fall for that long, and when it did fall, it fell less each time. So each area and understanding what happens is really important. So Belfast and Glasgow, those are kind of like the worst case scenarios that we've seen anywhere. Whereas Edinburgh and Cardiff are fairly normal in terms of prices fell by about 18 months. And so I say to people, look, if you're going to buy now and everything goes wrong, well, you're still going to have to pay your mortgage, aren't you? And you still probably got it at a pretty good rate. And what would you do if you didn't? Live with mum and dad, pros and cons, both sides. Side with anybody here, um, and you still have to pay rent, wouldn't you? So, what does it matter? You're still going to have there's a cost of putting your roof over your head. We're so obsessed with market what happens to the market, which we can't control, but you can control the cost of the roof over your head, and you still have to pay it, whatever's happening. So, we should be less obsessed about the market. You kind of you're having an understanding about investors is useful, but actually, it's about finding a good deal and finding a good property on a good road that can survive the worst happening. So, do you go into a little bit more detail. Um, so we look at Cambridge, it's really interesting. Look at that, fell by 20%, uh, just as everywhere else pretty much did. One year and three months, it didn't, suffer, it didn't fall for long. Another thing I say to buyers now is say, look, worst comes to worst, make sure you get, for example, talk to a broker about getting mortgage protection. And I said to them, and actually, you might not have thought about this, but the last story I heard about mortgage which I thought was interesting, because everybody's panic, what if I buy and prices for? One of the things they don't consider is being a couple, not being able to get the sofa in the lift on the second floor flat, taking that sofa up to the second floor, falling and breaking their back. So shocks and problems can occur at any time. Your job is to mitigate that risk. Fortunately, they had not so whether it was Brexit, whether it was a fall, whatever it is, they were protected. And that's all you can ever do, and there are things out there that can help you. So for me, if you're in Cambridge, you say, well look, you know, worst comes to the worst, you split up, somebody dies, something, life gets in the way, this stuff happens. So you're going to probably have to rent it out for a few years before prices recover and we can sell. So bear that in mind, and as long as you know what might happen, have a plan just in case it does, and talk to your advisors so that they can help you. And what I've got here is what, what the forecasts are, and this is really just to say to you, look, you've had this amazing capital growth over the last sort of 20 years, um, and maybe some of you will have had it over the last 10, maybe some of you won't. It's not expected to go to be around for the next five years. So you just need to know that. East of England, 
not much this year, 2% following year, over a five year period, 9%. That would in the past have been 25% over a five year period. So bear in mind if you, you know, that your capital growth is not just necessarily going to land at your door unless you have a quarter of the property. Okay, so you really, really have to uh, be aware of that. And we do all of these forecasts and we update them um, on a regular basis. Uh, and my reminder for this is prices are individual. So it depends on the property that you have. Look at this amazing property. It's gone up, you know, uh, it went up in value, reasonable amount to 2013. But look, already in just a couple of years, I've sold it for less. So the trick is you're never forced to be in this situation if you want to be in for property. And there's ways that you can kind of do that. Just make sure that you can always afford that property even if life gets in the way. This one could probably be a better bet, wouldn't it? You could have spent less money in it. It's all about the individual property these days, not about um, uh, the averages that you see. And this property is done really well. Nothing special about it, two bed flat, and you've seen nice increases over the years. So just as there is a bit of doom and gloom about, just as prices are to grow at what they want, doesn't mean you can't make money. You just have to be smarter at what you do and not buy any property on any street, which we had got into a bit of a habit uh, of doing, and it would just make money. The good news is, for those of you that are into this for Inca, is the rental income picture is good. And it is expected to rise, partly because wages are rising better than inflation, and inflation is expected to uh, fall over the coming years. Uh, and you've got, of course, this completely different picture in this of in which are actually more incomes are pretty good here. And so you need to think about the kind of tenants that you have and who are the guys that can afford to pay the most, and making sure you really target your property um, at the tenants who have got the money. Because despite the fact that there's some difficulties out there, there are always people out there who have got the money. So in summary, as far as the market is concerned, property rise is still expected to rise, but at a lower level. Okay? And it is very individual to each property, which I hope I've, I've managed to get. <coughs> Rents expected to rise, but please don't, you know, they might rise by five, seven and a half percent, but they can only rise in line with wages. Okay, they just won't do anything more than that. But that's the wage of your tenant and your target tenant. So that's what's important. And some people will be getting better wage prices than others, and it's important to know who. So what does this mean for you? We have a really uncertain market. But you should be investing for the next 15 to 20 years. So you haven't got people to go around that, you? So it is uncertain. So that is part of investing in property. You deal with uncertainty. And hopefully some of the sort of tools and some of the things that I've shown you tonight will help you do that. You have to invest for the long term. You saw with each of those individual properties, if you'd hung on to it long enough and been able to do that, it would have got out of the hot water that it did, for example, during the credit crunch. My best advice is building capital growth in the daily buy. That might mean you know where you're value. That might be that you managed to get it for a deal. Um, that, um, for example, there are some great deals around at the moment because there aren't many guys um, who are, are looking to purchase because they're a bit nervous. Your sole property price data, that's the best thing you can do. <coughs> just start looking, just start looking at your road, just start looking at your mum's road, at auntie's road, whatever it is. As soon as you get your head around those, it's much, much easier to understand what works well, uh, what probably is working well, and do so over over time. <coughs> Keeping up with the legals, I know Max is going to talk about that, uh, and that is that is just so important. Uh, they are after you, and they will come get you, uh, and more money is being poured into enforcement. So, and the defence of, oh, I didn't know that. Funnily enough, when they're after a 30 grand fine, because they can then keep a lot of the local authorities, that's not going to matter. Okay, so please bear in mind that. And, as I said, understanding and mitigate the risks. Prices will go up, down, stay the same. You've got your objectives, make sure you've got a plan uh, to fit that. The one thing I would say is, I think people are getting better, but I've met tens of thousands of landlords and I've spoken to them on a one-to-one -one basis a lot. And I find sometimes you're not always very good at getting help. And actually, the reason you invest in property is because you don't trust anybody else. And I get that. But please stop that for the next five years. It won't work in your favour. <laughs> you need somebody to help you understand what to buy and where. Because things are changing very rapidly and certainly potentially could over the next few months depending on what happens. So you need somebody who really knows the local area well to help you. 
and so you've got a couple of guys here tonight from Maxine Nesta. Gearing and mortgages. A lot of you will own property with cash. If you own a property with cash, it has to grow at least in value at 3% every single year to stand still. Let alone more than that to count for the costs of actually owning that property and selling that property and maintaining it. Those four passes are there. The reason why to let was always successful is because people here, i.e. they've got mortgages. So you, if you don't have thought about that concept or don't quite understand how it works, definitely talk to the uh, mortgage guys about it. Put your hand up if you would like to pay more tax than you need. No? No takers on that one? I did actually have one person at one point that did actually put their hand up and they thought, no, that's the wrong thing to do, but I've seen that. So, there is no need to do that. There are some wonderful ways, legally, of much tax. I don't understand. You will ne I don't believe that you really can grasp the tax stuff uh, yourself. If you need expert help to do that. So please, if you haven't done that for a little while, do get that help. I'm not earning anything out of any of you going to these services, because I don't believe in it. I'm telling you this because I'm trying to help you do the right thing and look after you. That's what everybody in this room cares about. And for me, it's almost forget location, location, location. Yes, it is important to buy that right property on the right street, and hopefully they'll give you an idea of how you can do that. But it's more about plan, plan, plan again. Plan to enter, buy to let if you haven't done it before. Plan on how you hold it, and how you can keep on to it, whatever happens. And plan your exit. Understand when, where, how much you're going to exit and what that tax bill will be. And that is the best advice that I can do. So, I think I've done on time. There we go.